and welcome to the brand new episode of the Yo DMB Raps podcast. May the 4th be with you. We've got a bit of a theme going on with today's show, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> I am obviously dressed as a stormtrooper representing the Star Wars today. And we have brought in a producer from Edinburgh in Scotland. He's got his latest release with us on Dirtbox Recordings. It's Beska. How you doing, mate? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. You're, you're looking a little pale there today. Little, uh, little steely face. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not, you're not looking very tanned yourself, to be fair. I know. I've got, uh, got producers tan, as they say. <laughs> let's, let's take these off. Let's take them off. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Let's get that up on the shelf up there. Awesome. Welcome to the show, Ruben. Thank you. Great to speak to you at last in person anyway, apart from uh, little Facebook chats and that. What have you been up to this weekend? Anything good? Uh, it was my dad's 60th birthday this weekend. So um, we had kind of a big party for that. And then we had like a barbecue on the Sunday. So that was good. It was just a kind of nice big family event with family and friends. So it was, it was, it was good to get it done. But they say Scotland's always raining, so do you just go ahead and have the barbecues in the rain then? Is that how it works up there? Yeah, basically. We well, yeah. We were we were lucky to be fair. It was uh it only rained for a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the other way around though, isn't it? Usually yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of minutes. It's actually kind of annoying. Like usually about this time of year, like it's my, my birthday's in a few days' time as well. And you know, whenever it's mine and my dad's birthday up here, it's usually quite nice this time in May. But yeah, it's been pretty rubbish. <laughs> Fair play, mate. Well, we'll get straight into it then today. We've got a lot to talk about. And uh, I want to start with obviously the theme of this and uh, Star Wars. So, mm -hmm. you know, how long have you been a fan of Star Wars then? Well, my whole life. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think. I, well, I was born in 92 and the, you know, the Phantom Menace came out in 99. Um, but I, before the Phantom Menace came out, they george lucas you know re-released all of the the original trilogy um and that was like there was like a big promotional campaign because they were re-released in the cinema as well so I, I got to see the original films in the cinema as well and and for me it was you know my dad was he you know he he, he wasn't obsessed with them when he was younger but he went to see them when he was a kid when they came out in like 77 and stuff like that and he remembers it and then you know he got to take me to see it and it was kind of like we kind of bonded a bit over that and it, you know it was just something i loved but it was also something he got, got kind of into so it was it was nice um and then yeah obviously the, the prequels came out in 99 and then 2001 and 2005 and you know i was i was the perfect age where you know and people that were old school star wars fans thought they were rubbish and i understand that but like as a as a nine-year-old that was like the best thing i'd ever seen in my life <laughs> yeah star, star wars were great for me i'm an 80s baby so I was born in 82 and and yet like you say, I think the first ones were what was it 77 79 and what was the third 77, one? it was there three years 77 1980 and 83 that's it yeah so I did catch them all but they were like through the 80s they were the thing you'd catch on TV all the time when there was a national holiday like Christmas and stuff you'd always get Star Wars on wouldn't you they'd always be on the TV and that and Indiana Jones weren't it they were always the ones like yeah, I mean, I'm a big indie fan as well. I think just you know anything George Lucas touches, in my opinion, was gold to that for oh, that, especially yeah. for that period of time. Um, I forgot he did those as well, didn't he? Yeah, he had something to do with those. Yeah, yeah, they came out on Lucas Lucas Arts. It was, it was they were directed by Steven Spielberg, but it was George Lucas's kind of idea. And obviously, Harrison Ford was in it as well, so it was kind of. My earliest memories of Star Wars were the with the figures. I got, I had quite a lot of the action figures, and. Um, what what's the uh stilt walker ones the two feeted walkers what are they called uh the at at, at sts yeah. that's it i um i remember going to skegness and every time we go on holiday me, me dad at the end of the holiday would buy me a toy so we went in the toy shop and i always remember i've still got a photo of me on the beach with one of those like the original ones like and that was like 1986 or something like wow, that wow yeah yeah like, that'd I, be worth I, something I, now <laughs> oh, mate it's a killer like i had everything like that like when i was young i had the star wars all the he-man toys all the figures for the he-man the castles and stuff like that and um 
yeah like uh, there was there was a big box of it and then i think like when i got to about 11 12 when i weren't really bothered my dad just got rid of them all at a car boot sale for about 100 quid and there was about 500 but yeah you look on ebay now for the star wars figures and the he like they're going for like four five six hundred pounds sometimes a thousand pounds aren't there some of those yeah i mean that's yeah i think the, the original star wars ones because before basically in 1977 when they released like the first one they um they didn't even they they basically the, the backlog there was such a massive demand for the original figures that like that, that came out in like i think september time and then in christmas and like they couldn't make enough toys so they, they sent away like you had to get a little card so people were expecting this like box set of all these like action figures but kids were waking up to they basically had like a gift voucher that said when the toys are ready you're gonna get them and and they obviously when they did get them like those that original like box of toys if you were to have that unopened with the card now i i don't know how much it's worth but it'll be a stupid amount of money <laughs> you're a proper geek with this then aren't you Ruben? you really know your stuff i think you know at the end of this interview i think i'm going to do a little star wars trivia for you i'm going to put this to the test so you're, you're giving me all this info now about it <laughs> yeah i must admit it is yeah i i don't know like i said it's been a part it's been like a kind of almost a passion of mine for so long and yeah. i don't know especially like, when I, when I, like you know, I get, if I get drunk for that and start talking to people about it, they kind of tend to be like, just shut up. <laughs> so you you must be proper buzzing about this Star Wars revival then over the last few years when Disney bought it then, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I thought that the, the new ones weren't that good. But I mean, I, I remember I was actually in Australia when the original, when sorry, when the first like teaser trailer for The Force Awakens came out, like the new, the, the like the first one like, coming out after Disney and like, I like couldn't sleep the night before because I knew it was coming out and like the trailer was amazing and I actually really enjoyed that film and I mean even when I went to see it in the cinema like my friend <laughs> we went to see with, like a big group of my friends because quite a lot of my friends are quite not like they're not quite as nerdy as me about it but a lot of them like it and um when we were sitting down and like before the film was coming on my mate Adam turned around to me and was like are you are you okay because I was just like fidgeting in my seat and like breathing weird and stuff and <laughs> I was like no I'm fine I'm just really really nervous if this is going to be good or not I actually really loved those middle three ones as well because th those were my because obviously the 80s ones <laughs> I didn't go to the cinema I just saw those on tv and video or whatever but the Phantom Menace and those three I actually saw those at the cinema and I remember really fucking enjoying those as well they 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 get a bad rap but i thought those were pretty good actually they were better than the new three anyway by far. yeah def definitely yeah yeah i mean they, they got a bad rap at the time and i think it's because if you were like a kid in the 70s when it came out like for most people it, you know they were quite different and i think you can't remember the star wars is for kids it really is predominantly made for children and it's like when you become an adult and then you try to watch this film that's for kids it's like it doesn't quite hold up in the same way like you don't you don't have the nostalgia playing like a massive factor in your love for it and and i mean maybe that's why i don't like the new ones as, as much you know maybe if i went to see you know seven eight and nine when i was you know six nine and twelve i would love them and i'm sure the kids nowadays do love those movies but for me they're just not as good but i mean i i do i don't hate them quite as much as i, I hate number eight i really did hate number eight but yeah <laughs> yeah was eight was eight the very last one or was no that... nine was the last one eight, eight yeah. was like eight was the oh, kind of middle one horrible it was all like comedy slapstick oh, Luke Skywalker tripping over it. it was like as if um what what what's the uh what's the the tv show now like uh i don't know like flintstones meets luke skywalker or something like that wasn't yeah, it yeah. slapstick comedy kind of thing it was yeah that was horrible yeah. I, the I, Han Solo I, one was good as well that was really good yeah, I'm disappointed that one flopped because yeah, I, I thought I think no, no, like when when they announced that solo movie, I, I get I was like against it. So I get I was like Han Solo is such a good character. He do, like he doesn't need a backstory. The fact that he doesn't have a backstory is what makes him actually so good to the character. But I actually ended up really enjoying it. But I just have a great story about number eight, the one that I hated because basically I think what made me hate it even more was we were me and my um, fiance were traveling around um, Southeast Asia when that came out. And we were basically on like a tiny little island in the middle of nowhere in Vietnam. And we kind of had to be there because Gemma was waiting for a, a delivery. So the nearest um, like cinema was a, was like a huge journey away. And basically I, I was like, I need to see it the day it comes out. So we traveled from like this tiny little paradise island to like the busiest like Hanoi, like the busiest place in Vietnam. That's like not a very nice city. It's pretty like dirty and kind of overrun. It's, and then like 
you know, we traveled so far to see this film, and then like when I came out of the cinema, I've never been more disappointed in my life. It's like I can't believe I can't believe how shit that was, and I can't believe how much effort I put in to see it. It was like oh. a double blow. <laughs> but there's uh, there's been a few yeah, there's been a few good and bad out of the new ones. Like I love that Mandalorian series. I, like every episode of that has been fantastic. The Boba Fett one. <laughs> That was pretty shit. It was so shit that he decided to throw a Mandalorian couple of episodes in it because they couldn't just go anywhere with it. And there's the other new one as well that everybody keeps going on at me about Andor, but I've watched like three episodes and it's hard work. I can't get, I can't bring myself to watch the fourth episode. I'm, I don't know what's going on. I just feel a bit bored. Are you going to say I, exactly what everybody else says to me and got to leave it, got to carry on a bit? Yeah, it's different, it's different mood. It's, it's more adult and it's definitely, you know, it's more, it's all dialogue. It's all kind of story driven. And and I, I love that, you know, I, I, that, my favorite TV show, although I'm a Star Wars geek and like a sci-fi fan, I do like just stuff that's just, you know, for me now, if my favorite movies are just like 100% dialogue, I don't need action. I just want that. And Andor is a little bit more like that. Um if you haven't watched the Kenobi series, I would de definitely recommend that, that, though. Yeah, that was good. That was because obviously we got to see a lot of Darth Vader in that, and that that obviously gets you tweaking your nipples a bit, doesn't it? If you're in the yeah, <laughs> like when we had Luke Skywalker. So yeah, I, d I love it. Like I say, I do like it. Um, obviously, I've not I've not got the the geekiness of what you have with it, but I, I definitely do love the show. So sorry to anybody else watching who's not a big Star Wars fan. We'll make sure we put markers in the interview so you can skip past all this bit anyway. But um, obviously, that brings us to why we, you know, why there's a big Star Wars theme around it. So your your artist name is Beska. So if you are watching Star Wars at the minute, there's been a lot of references to that in The Mandalorian, hasn't there? So what made you choose that name? And if you just want to tell people about it as well and why uh, why that's familiar with Star Wars fans. Um, I mean, there isn't really a great story behind that. I went on a different alias for like a long, long time. And then I decided, you know, that I wanted to focus primarily on drum and bass and in order to do that, I thought the best thing to do would just be to change my name. And at the time, it was just after the first Mandalorian season had come out, and I was trying to think of things that were kind of Star Wars related, because in my head, I was kind of like, you know, I love Star Wars, and I love, like, music, and especially drum and bass. And it was like, how can I how can I fuse these two loves, basically? And that was just, it was just a cool, cool word. It's basically, it's a name for, like, the metal that the Mandalorians use to craft their armor out of. And, um... I don't know. I just thought I just thought it was a cool sounding name. Basically, that's that's as, that's as simple as it gets. And for my first few like releases, I tried to like I, up until very recently, nearly all of my like titles of my tracks have been Star Wars related as well. Is that every single one as well? I mean, I know the two new ones on uh, Dirtbox, which is Wilhelm Scream. That's a Star Wars reference, and Mount Arakinakis. Is that right? I don't know. Yeah, my Eric <laughs> or something. My Eric So they're Star Wars reference, but has every single track up till now been a Star Wars reference name? Then I don't think so. I think like like I said, for my first two or three releases, they were. Um, no, there has been a basically every time I've done anything that's had like that's been a feature in or a collab, I've tried. I've like I've I've not made it like an absolute rule, um, and I definitely have stuff coming out later this year that's even solo stuff that um isn't star wars related because it, it it was kind of i, I love to i'll do it as much as possible but it's kind of it's kind of restricting and especially because i've been starting working a lot more with vocalists and stuff like that so you know you want the lyrics to be basically what the song's about yeah you don't you don't need a female singer going on about uh may the fourth and star destroyers <laughs> and stuff do you really? well well you say that but then my uh my two my two i've got a, i've got a double i've got a, an a b coming out on program in like a few months time and both of those tracks are half a half of the same female vocalist and both of those tracks are like the lyrics i wrote them are all about star wars <laughs> so uh, these these there's two tracks of yours here i've got your i've got your discography open um and i'm going to question a couple of these because I, I don't even know if these thunder wasp is that yeah. is that star wars related yep so that is the name of grand admiral thron's ship Ah, oh, right okay and the jungle this has got to be star wars the jungle of kashik Kashyyyk. So Kashyyyk is the planet that um, Chewbacca is from. So that, okay. funny enough, I just quick, quickly about that track was quite funny, was basically I seen that, you know, um, Deep in the Jungle were doing another Jungle Wars LP. And, you know, I, I, I like those LPs anyway, but I was like, I, I've like, I, I've seen on Facebook basically saying that it's like, like last few days to like get your submissions in. 
and I was just like, I need to be on this. Like it just it makes sense. So like I was actually in the shower that morning and like that's 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 got like a hook in it. And I just like was singing it in the shower and I like literally went into the studio, recorded that hook and made that track within about eight hours, like self-mastered it and just sent it to DJ Hybrid and he signed it straight away. And like he was well happy because he was like anything else Star Wars related send it my way. And I was like, well, all my stuff Star Wars related. So <laughs> Could have got an exclusive signing with you there then possibly <laughs> but good label to be on though isn't it hybrid's absolutely smashing things with that label so yeah yeah i mean i don't get me wrong i i i, lo I love all subgenres of drum and bass jungle is probably not my least favorite but it's you know it's it's, it's actually what got me into drum and bass but I, you know I, I i find it a little bit boring to produce so like i do enjoy doing the occasional track here and there but um you know i think it, i don't ever see myself doing a full jungle ep to send to hybrids but you know, if he's doing VAs and stuff, I'll definitely put send him tracks. So what are you gonna do when you run out of Star Wars names? Do you think that's gonna be possible? No, this the the universe is too big, I think. <laughs> and I they'll keep know. making new stuff, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Right? And it's like I, I you know, I read a lot of the books. Most of most of my actual like names that I've come up with are stuff that are stuff that's in novels rather than the movies. Because the movies are pretty limited, but the expanded universe is so massive that it's like yeah. You know, the, the, the vocal that's on that Mount Air Qcos is like, that is actually a line from a book. And I just, I like, I like the name of the, I like the sound of the name. So I've like, I've got a tech, I've got like a text file on my phone where I, every time I, every time I hear one, I write it down kind of thing. And then I can look back at it. And I actually like, I think I, I Googled it or like, I Googled it, like, just because I wanted to know a bit more about it. And on like Wikipedia, which is the Star Wars Wikipedia, it's called Wikipedia, um, it had like it had that excerpt from the book but yeah like it also had like a clip from the audiobook which is actually the the vocal that I, the sample that i use in that track is like a, that's a sample from that star wars audiobook that's brilliant that's brilliant well I, I think out of all the names that you chose though for your actual artist name besk has got to be one of the coolest ones hasn't it definitely yeah it just works it just <laughs> sounds really cool and it's like and it's, it's quick and it's simple and and and, and you know i feel like it, it sounds cool even if you don't know anything about star wars but then people that like star wars will like ah cool kind of thing so you mentioned that you were using another name as well before beska for when you were doing was it the like the 140 bpm <laughs> music that you were doing before drum and bass i was doing everything it was so it was, yeah it was deadlock so like like lock like lock ness but like um so deadlock um and that was since i first started like but I used to play in bands and stuff like that. And then I kind of stopped. Um, I would not stop. I still played in bands, but I got into kind of more dubstep and 140 stuff is kind of what started it. Um, you know, in about 08, 09-ish when dubstep, like the first wave of like the OG kind of UK dubstep started coming in, I got really, really into it. And and that um, that basically made me kind of put down the guitar and open up the door kind of thing. And, and that's what got me into like i'll never forget the first time I, I applied like a sine wave to like a filter to make like a wub 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 i thought i was like a production god and like you know that was so that's kind of dubstep's kind of what got me into that and then um, but under deadlock i ended up doing like everything i produced like actually a couple of hip-hop albums that like me and my friend did and then like i produced dubstep i did a little bit of hard style i did like a lot of house and and a bit, a bit of drum and bass here and there as well, and and I did so I did quite a lot of like metal, and I did like a really weird kind of like concept like rock album um for a while, and like all this stuff, you know, I, not, hardly any of it's online. It all exists in like a CD collection in my dad's like conservatory. Like <laughs> that's that's that, but I, I did it just because I enjoyed doing it. It was more of a hobby, and then um yeah, I, when I decided like no I, I i need like i think what what made me change to beskar was i just i like i got really i was always in a drum and bass but i got massively massively into it um about six seven years ago and was just kind of like right i want to focus all my effort on that um but what i don't want to do is like i really like the name deadlock but i don't want to like start getting somewhere and people like youtube deadlock and it's like videos of me in like a pink suit like rapping about being a gardener and so which is like i genuinely have those videos on youtube and it's like i didn't want that to get mixed up basically i wanted the best car stuff to be like this is just drum and bass and like although like i don't take myself too seriously i still you know deadlock was like totally tongue-in-cheek half the time as well as so the best guy i wanted it to be a little bit more focused excellent and do you, are you planning on reusing the name is it going to have any other productions coming out at some point or is it dead and gone 
No, no, a deadlock is not dead. <laughs> I think there will. I, I kind of have a couple of ideas. Um, you know, I I play a lot of guitar and stuff like that, and um, you know, um, I I kind of had this idea that like I think the next time I do like a full album is Deadlock, I will it will be like a weird concept album where it's completely genre define it like comp like molds it all different genres into one because that's kind of what I started to do a bit with Deadlock before I changed the name. Um, I also have been writing like a few a few little acoustic tracks and stuff like that because I play the guitar and and I think I'll I'll probably release some of those as Deadlock at some point probably this year um but yeah so it's it's not it's not completely dead but you know the best guard stuff's actually starting to to like go somewhere and i'm kind of it's kind of a nightmare with deadlock because it was like i'd I'd write music like for an ep or an album i'd release it and then i'd never promote it i'd never gig it i'd just start writing something new so it's like i i, do, I don't want that to happen with best guard so yeah yeah no i i know exactly what you mean because obviously like we'll touch on this a little bit later on. This is one of the reasons for you kind of getting into the DJing as well, isn't it? So you can get the promo side of it out there a little bit. But we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, you've mentioned your dad a couple of times, and I know we've had this conversation as well. It seems as though your dad is definitely one of your biggest fans when it comes to your music career. I think we had one of these, uh, by the way, these T-shirts are for sale. And uh, I think the first one to get was probably your dad, wasn't it? We were I think so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, if you go on to any of our socials at Dirtbox Recordings, you can buy these. And there's a limited edition Beskar one as well. So go and pick that up. I'll actually put the link in the description of this video. Um, but over in Scotland, in Edinburgh, tell us a little bit about growing up with your family, what it was like, you know, anything like that. And uh, how, you know, how supportive they are of your music career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, it was, um, they've always, they've always been super, super supportive of my my career um yeah i grew up my mum and my dad separated when i was quite young but um you know i was they were always they ended amicably and i was always you know it's kind of between the two of them and both of them were always very very much you know they both loved music my, my dad maybe more so than my mum loved music but my dad was like he never really played an instrument he plays a little bit of guitar and he used to sing in like a punk band in the 70s and stuff but you know it, it was more being around his taste of music that got me into music because because he literally listens to everything like you know he grew up in the 70s he was a punk rocker but you know he you know ltj bookham was like is one of his favorite artists like he was massively in a drum and bass like you know in the 90s when it first started coming about and he loves reggae so the jungle thing just totally worked for him as well and then in the 90s he got massively into you know techno and house and stuff like that and that whole scene he was into the club and scene arguably maybe a little bit too old to be in at that point but he was like bugger it he just he loved it so you know that was you know he, he's listened to everything so i grew up around everything and he was always really keen for me to like play an instrument like you know he bought me my first guitar and he always made sure that i was practicing and stuff like that and then when i got into high school i got really really heavily into death metal um and i played in like like one death metal band for like most of my high school career and you know my dad was insane like crazy supportive of that like he used to let us practice in his conservatory um which the neighbors would have hated but like my, my the drummer stayed like a couple of streets up from me and my dad like we practice every saturday and my dad would drive around on the saturday morning put all of the drums in the back of his car drive to his house we'd set them up we'd practice for like all day and then he'd take the drums back to like the drummer's house that that night so and he did that every saturday for like three years <laughs> so so did you have a big family growing up then as well or was it you was it mostly just you and your dad around this uh yeah i mean i had my mum on my mum's side we had, I had a bigger family i've got like a half sister on one side and then my mum married um she didn't marry but she had like a long time partner for a while who had like three kids from a previous marriage so you know i was i was always uh i had a big kind of a big family on my mum's side like with loads of kids and about and then on my dad's side i was always an only child but um and my dad my my mum's my mum's boyfriend for like from when i was about four to 18 um who's actually the father of my half sister um you know he was also he was massively on music as well like his record collection is stupidly big and then um, so so he was also quite a big influence on that and he you know he he arguably has even more very taste than my dad but like some of the stuff he listens to is just absolutely bonkers <laughs> it sounds as though you've had i mean uh, there's a running theme obviously when i'm speaking to people as well is that uh when we're into this kind of music it seems to go from 
something like rock or metal based into something maybe a bit more crazy and then eventually finding drum and bass because that that's where it happened for me as well and uh quite a few others that i've actually spoke to doing the same thing did you have any other kind of in-between musics i know you moved on to like dubstep and things like that but what was the kind of bridge that got you from that to dance music and producing and things like that yeah i think yeah dubstep was it because again i was into metal and i was still playing in metal bands around about that time when the dubstep movement started coming around and like you know although it's a lot like I, I, when i'm talking i talk about dubstep i think of like the kind of more chilled out stuff so you know i also listen to a lot of reggae but in like i, I mean i love dubstep because i used to be a big storer i'm not anymore but like when i was a teenager i was and that was just like the best music to listen to like that but then um i think the, the 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 dubstep thing especially as it started to get heavier like when it started to go into the more kind of like gore step for like Borgore and stuff like that and then obviously skrillex took it on and did his own thing but that started to then you know the kind of the breakdowns in that were kind of like death metal breakdowns you know you had like a wub, 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 and it was like that could just be a ging, 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 like guitar so it kind of that that kind of bridged the gap between metal and electronic music for me and then you know, I mean, Neurofunk is definitely, definitely has that. Um, and, and you know, I think, I, I mean, I'll never forget the first time I, like the first time I ever heard um, Cone Sound um, and Asa did an EP called Sanctuary. Um, and like they had a track on that called Pseudo's Redemption. And it had just this, like the start of it was just like this crazy organic, like moving neural base where it's like, you know, how you get that with just like loads of fillers and stuff like that. And it was just, and I never forget the first time I heard that being like, that is insane. Like that sound design, like how the hell did they do that? And like, that was almost a turning point where I was like, I need to make music like that. Um, and obviously they were kind of more neural breaky stuff, but you know, at the time like glitch hop and that that kind of kind of i don't know it just kind of all molded into one and then i was always in a drum and bass like pendulum especially like you know i saw them so many times um live in like the the late noughties sorry the late 2000s early noughties you know they were they were they were at every festival i was at so like i think at one point they were the band i'd seen the most um but then you know later, later on I kind of I forget about it but like like i said my dad always listened to it and it was there but i just kind of never really expanded on my knowledge of it too much um and then i remember congo Nati's jungle revolution album coming out and like my dad was playing that and i was like that is awesome because i had a lot of dubstep in it as well but and it, but it was like it was jungle but it just it had a bit more of a tempo to it and i don't know that that really was kind of one of the turning points where i was like i, I want to make this <laughs> And you, uh, just to go back to obviously uh, what you do outside of music as well, your day job's a firefighter, isn't it, as well? So Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? I mean, obviously, to be into, really into passion for music and going into some kind of death-defying job like that. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the firefighting role. Um, so my old man was a firefighter. So, you know, I was always around it when I was a kid. Um, and it was always in the back of my mind that it would maybe be something I would do. I went to uni and did like digital interaction design and I, I don't know, it never really was for me. Um, and then I went traveling for a long time, like by myself. And then I came back and I met my missus and like, we went traveling together for a long time as well after that. And then, you know, once I came back, it was like, right now, what do I do? And then I need a job, like a proper career job. And like I said, that was always in the back of my mind. So I just thought, just thought I'd go for it. And it's it's brilliant i love it it's, a, it's an amazing job and it's like how, how old were you when you when you went went for the role and when you uh, when you went for the job oh only a couple of years ago ah right um um but it's like it's such a it's such a good job but I, I love it so much that it's almost i'm almost like the music side of things like i think i'm in a very unique position in a position that i'm really happy about where it's like with the music is i don't want it to be my full-time career do you know i like I, it's not it's not even a desire of mine anymore like I, I i do it because i love making it and you know if other people like listening to it that's great it's basically just a hobby that's got out of hand and you know for me especially the idea of being like you know if you're gonna make it your full-time career you're gonna have to be a touring dj and it's like that's just not the life i've you know maybe when i was younger but like right now it's like i'm 30 if we're, we're getting married next year and like i'm just you know it's just not really the life i want to be honest i'm quite I'm, i love my job as well so it's like yeah it's it's a very good point as well because obviously in a music career obviously when you start to get that your job and you rely on it 
then even when it's not fun, you've got to do it. And I, I, I'm the same as well. I think that it can actually, it can take the fun out of the music and out of what you're doing if you're actually relying on that for your full-time job and things like that as well. I feel like, yeah, I, I definitely have a similar, a similar thought process with that where it's good to actually do it when you want and do what you want when you want, isn't it? It feels a lot more creative that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've never really had any sort of pressure behind me with the music. Um, in fact, I did once. The only time I've ever had pressure was when I sent I sent a couple of tracks to program and they liked one but didn't like the other one. So they were kind of like, we love this, but you need to write something to go with it for like an AB. And then it was like, oh, God, it's like the pressure was so on as well, because it's like, you know, they're one of my favorite labels. And it was like, what do I do? Um, and I, and I, I spent ages on that. And I mean, the pressure worked because the track that I actually made out of it is arguably probably my best track I've ever done. But it was like it almost wasn't fun making it because <laughs> it was like too much pressure that like, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say dirt box then. I thought we were gonna <laughs> we were gonna unveil something there that I just put the pressure and the feelers on you to get this EP sorted. That's all. <laughs> so obviously, with all this music around you, were there any clubbing experiences as well? Because obviously, you could have been going out to see bands play and things like that. You mentioned obviously seeing Pendulum. Was there any raves or anything like that? Because for me, like Scotland is definitely one of the the meccas of rave music. You know, if you think back at the roots of what came out of there you've got you know artists like entrance scott brown tom wilson and then you've got raves like fantasia and resurrection which is obviously the early 90s and stuff what were your kind of early rave experiences in scotland and and do you still do any of them now um yeah so i think when i was a teenager like i was i was i was more into metal and i was more into kind of bands and stuff so i did see them but you know like i said I, you know when i for my 18th birthday we went to like a club in called in edinburgh called the bongo club which is like the, the only club in edinburgh now that does like underground kind of music and they had like a, a, dub, a dubstep night on on a wednesday called jungle dub and it was dubstep and they went in a jungle at the end kind of thing um so you know we used to go to that quite regularly um but in terms of like actual raves and stuff I mean, Tea in the Park was like the festival in Scotland, and they had the Slam Tent, which was like run by Slam, who are that as in you know, DJ Slam, as in yeah, yeah, DJ Slams, yeah. So, so oh right, okay, okay, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of DJ Slam. He was on the uh, well, he had tracks on like the 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 Bonkers hardcore mm -hmm. albums, isn't he, on Sharky and stuff. So yeah, mm -hmm. big fan of him. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go on. So he was uh, he was running tents at Tea in the Park, was he? Yeah, so it's it's actually two guys slam, but yeah, so it's yeah. basically they they ran the slam tent at Tea in the Park, which was like Tea in the Park was mostly bands, but they always had the slam tent, which did like like house music and and, and loads of dance music, but it was mostly kind of house and techno. Um, I mean, for the very first Tea in the Park, which my dad actually went to the in '99, they had, uh, sorry, '97, they had um, Daft Punk head like the slam tent and like last, so you know they always had big names. I've seen Green Velvet there quite a few times and. Um, like yeah just loads of people like uh, most of the time when i was at the slam tent i didn't know who i was seeing like to be honest but it was uh that was always like a big a big part of the rave scene in in scotland but as far as clubs and stuff i didn't really when i was a teenager i was at uni and i wasn't really like i'd go and see bands and stuff but when i went to a club it was just to get drunk basically it wasn't like there wasn't many big raves like they were happening but it wasn't really my scene like i said i was more into metal when, once i got a little bit older and kind of got a bit more into dance music i would then start to be a bit more like but again like i've got loads of pals that are in the side trans community in scotland so i was into that for a while and that was all just like illegal raves which which were great and it was like in the woods kind of near scotland and eh, sorry near edinburgh and stuff so um that side of things I did a bit more but in terms of drum and bass that's only been very very recently um you know I, I think it's always been there but it's definitely been a bit more of a revival in the last few years um and it's quite there's a couple of regular nights that are putting you know like every wednesday night there's a drum and bass night on in, in edinburgh that's, that's always rammed um and then at the weekend there's a few so a couple of guys i know quite well um another producer called ominous who's from edinburgh like he, he puts on a night called night shift um and i played that for the first time like I headlined that actually for the first time, like like last month, um, and you know that was my first proper nightclub, um, I playing out. It. Oh, it was amazing! <laughs> so good. It was. Um, You've yeah, got a book now for DJing, then I guess, yeah. 
Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah, and it, and it is it is awesome, and it's it's something I want to do more of, um, and it's something that doesn't really come naturally to me. Like I said, I, I was more in bands, and then I started producing, and then I, like I had to, I only bought like my Pioneer like um, RX three, you know, at the start of this year. Um, I could always do it a little bit because we used to like we used to put like raves on in our house and stuff like that, and like we'd be playing stuff, but it was on like a you know a Tractor S four controller, and I was I sync was on all the time, and it was like I wasn't really like trying to do it properly. Um, so the start of this year, it was kind of I need to do this in order for like my career to kind of develop a little bit as best car because it's it's you know it's hard to get your name out there just as a producer. You need to be DJing as well, and and yeah, I'm glad I have because it's. I fucking loved it. It was great. <laughs> and it'd be good for your music as well, because you, you're going to get an idea of what works a little bit more when you actually play them as well. And it'll definitely give you some inspiration for writing music, because you'll know what tracks you want to make to fit in that set for that club or for that track to mix with that, I suppose, as well. So do you find that you're getting a little bit more like inspiration for certain things and new, you know, new styles for your music as well from it? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a little bit. I think it's still early days yet. I've only ever played live in a club once. I've played in like a couple of pubs like prior to that. Um, there's a thing in, in Edinburgh called Sunday Service, where it's like the first Sunday of every month they have like a, it's like a, just a pub that does like almost like an open mic for drum and bass DJs. Um, so that was really good to like first like wet my whistle a little bit and kind of just try it out for a little bit before going to the actual club. But hopefully I'll be getting a bit more gigs here and there now. Um and then, yeah, I'm sure that well, that will happen. I haven't found it happen just yet, but like I said, it's still early days. Is your dad planning to come and see any gigs? Do you think? Yeah, so he, he always came to see like gigs when I was in bands and stuff. And like I said, when I was playing that last night shift, he was like, uh, he was see, like I said, he was sixty at the weekend there, and he's kind of like, you know, I was I'm on from one till two, and he was just kind of like, nah, I don't know about that. I'm maybe a bit too old. But then after after it, like the day after he messaged me and was like i just so regret not coming the next time you do it i'll be there <laughs> fair play to him does he uh did it does he used to go to any of the big raves and things like we mentioned resurrection and fantasia did he do things like that yeah think? yeah yeah so resurrection he loved he was at every resurrection <laughs> he cool. loved it so he's got plenty of stories then if i mention obviously people like scott brown to him and things like that you'll know those guys yeah, I mean that was that was definitely his thing in the nineties. He was massively into it there, like Scott Brown and yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't really know them that well, but he that was his thing. Like he was, he, he loved Resurrection. He was there all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's no secret, especially on this show as well. I've probably talked about it on every episode, but I come from an hardcore background, so obviously Scott Brown was something who I knew, somebody who I knew very well, and one of my peers. I, I actually released some music on his label as well back in the day, so. He's mm. definitely like one of the biggest exports, I would say, to come out. And, of course, the late, great Tom Wilson as well, big popular DJ in the Scottish scene as well. I uh, I believe he died, though, a few years ago, unfortunately. And, mm. uh, oh, yeah, you can't forget Calvin Harris as well. Obviously, there's probably probably no bigger name worldwide than Calvin Harris to come out. No, I, I remember I saw Calvin Harris at Tea in the Park Festival when it was like when he was the front man of his band for the first album and he was like on at like midday on the main stage like it was just like a nobody i think he had like born in the 80s was the only track that anybody knew and it's just it's crazy to think that how far he's come um where he's from is a tiny tiny little kind of area of scotland as well like down in the kind of borders and that's where my dad's from so um yeah i don't know he's made a serious name himself <laughs> So through all of this music that's obviously been happening through your life, when did you take the plunge to first start electronically producing music? We know you're doing bands and things like that at a young age, but when did you sit down in front of a computer and decide to do some dance music? Uh, 2009. Um, wow. Which was, yeah, like I said, it was the dubstep thing. It was just, you know, that was basically what made me want to do it. Um, just, yeah, I have never, like, I heard basically your standard wobble bass on like oh. uh where where did you where was it where you kind of took that plunge though so with, with the dubstep did you just kind of hear the music and think i want to make it because obviously you'd have that kind of background with producing and stuff with the instruments or was it you saw somebody producing it you know where did it go from um i think it was just that it was like the first time i'd you know i played the guitar and stuff but it was the first time i'd heard it's the first time i thought yeah i want to make that you know I'd, I'd always listen to like daft punk and kind of like electronic music and stuff but it was never like it was never like i want to make that i was quite happy doing guitar and 
you know on drums and stuff like that and bands and it was just it was just that like i said that that initial i remember the first the, like i heard that wobble bass and was just like i want to know how that's done so like I, I basically i wanted to make it and then and that's basically what made me open a door i think i Hmm, I'm kind of slightly remembering that wrong because it was so long ago. But I think I actually I did I I was using Logic at that time to record like guitar based music as well. Um, so I kind of already had a basic understanding of how it worked from recording like my vocals and guitar and stuff into it. But I'd never decided to like open a soft synth or anything like that until dubstep, basically. Do you still use the same door then? Are you still using Logic now? No, I actually switched to Ableton around the time that I thought I wanted to do Vescar. So it was, I, I moved house and set up this studio that I'm in right now um, and was just kind of like, I want to just take the plunge and just learn Ableton because I don't know, it just, it, it just looked better and like half the tutorial, like I, I was only going to get better by watching tutorials on YouTube and stuff like that. And most of them were in Ableton. So I was just kind of like, bugger it i had a little bit of money as well so like i just i just straight up bought it and then it was just went from there fair play yeah logic it, it's it's definitely one of the the stronger ones you can use out there but i always say it's kind of taking the long way around on things when this stuff like between and ableton availability you now that it's it's just a bit quicker isn't it yeah. a bit more fun to use i think as well isn't it generally yeah I and mean, i actually still use logic in my macbook pro for recording vocals um just a lot because. of people still use them for mix downs as well don't they they'll they'll do the arrangement in ableton and they'll move on to logic or even cubase to do their mix downs because of the sound drivers in there yeah yeah well i know solo do that because because i've got a few releases on grand theft audio and and they you know we did mastering sessions with them and um yeah they they use ableton to produce and logic to to master and they, yeah i use it for vocals because they, they basically it has a built-in kind of almost like melodyne um into logic which like i've always used and you know i I could buy melodyne but it's like i own logic i own a macbook pro it's yeah. just it's easy to do it and 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 it's kind of my the way my pc is set up like you can't really see it but it's kind of awkward for me to then record vocals i like having the macbook and just be able to have the macbook in front of me while i'm recording vocals you know and just press the space bar it's right there um it just makes it a lot easier and we're going to be moving um again probably late this year early next year and i'll be getting an even bigger studio space so i'm planning on building like a vocal booth which i'll have like a laptop in permanently for that same situation so with a the dubstep then what was your first release because i haven't actually taken a look at the deadlock discography at all i've seen the facebook page and stuff but what what was your first release under that name and alias uh, God, i don't even know <laughs> honestly um <laughs> do you remember I, some of the labels that you you released on for it as well i didn't really i've never released on any labels as deadlock it was all self-releasing Um, it was oh, never no. i never i never even tried i never once even tried to send it to a label it was just more i was making it because i wanted to make it and then like i said i would i would make i like i've always done artwork as well so like i would make my own artwork and like i'd get cds made that i'd like give to a couple of my mates and i'd mm. obviously give to my dad and stuff like that but it was never I never really tried to get on any labels at that point and again that was something that when i went to beskar i was like i need to, like i'm never going to self-release as beskar because i've done that all the time as deadlock and like i said all i was doing was just producing like an album or an ep self-releasing it never promoting it and then just starting to write something new and it was just like it wasn't going to get anywhere it was never going to get anywhere doing that and and it was fun and i'd like i don't regret it. i still love doing it but um well, if any 140 BPM or less tracks come back out of the studio under that name, hit us up. We've obviously got the Are You Serious label, so we'd be glad to sign some more music from your room with that. Yeah, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to. I would like to, you know, I actually did a, a dubstep EP as Beskar, but yeah, I would quite like to do some as some Deadlock as well. So yeah, definitely. So those Deadlock things, do you think we're going to find them on things like SoundCloud, uh, Bandcamp, <laughs> things like that? Yeah, uh, a lot of it's a Bandcamp bandcamp's yeah. where most of it is so i think there's a couple of albums and eps on bandcamp and um, i actually ended up removing quite a lot of it from like it was all on soundcloud and then i lost email and then i, I can't remember it just got kind of got lost in the ether that is the internet and um, some of it i removed myself especially like, i removed all the hip-hop stuff myself because like i now work as a firefighter and i was like i don't want that to be out there basically <laughs> <laughs> and what was you rapping about you actually did the vocals as well didn't you yeah so me and my mate did vocals and i mean yeah i think we just 
yeah yeah I'm not vanilla gonna, I'm not, bad. <laughs> it's not bad I, I actually i'm actually really proud of it like the first yeah, album that we did i love like i think it's brilliant but it's it's not just with the way the world's going with pc mad it's really not like suitable for uh, like you know if if people if pe if that was online and someone found it in my job and like listened to it and like took direct quotes from it and said like firefighter partington said this on like <laughs> i'd lose my job so it was like nah <laughs> just take it down <laughs> Yeah, it's not really worth that. I'm sure there's some questionable podcasts I've done in the past as well with things like that. But luckily, I'm not a firefighter, so yeah. I don't think anybody could cancel me, unfortunately. So is it fair to say then in 2021, the release on Intoxicated, that was probably your first official release on a label then? Because that was yeah. the base, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. So that was um that was basically my, my now good friend liam who's ominous um so i oh. basically was i was just producing music at, i was just i started making the um drum and bass and i like a couple a friend of like we have a mutual friend who basically was like my mate liam has like his own label in edinburgh like you know you could release on like message him release on that and I actually sent him like loads of tracks and he basically said no to all of them because they were because at the time because I, I wasn't a dj and i wasn't thinking about producing for djs so like all my drum and race tracks they didn't adhere to like your standard structure that would be like dj friendly it was just all over the place and he was like look the production's great but none of it works i would sign none of it because none of it is djable um and he kind of taught me how to like write it for that kind of side of things um and then he did that va and then I had like an EP ready to go. And Liam basically, he basically messaged me and was like, look, man, he was kind of in a bad place at the time with mental health and stuff. And he was just like, look, I, you know, I want to sign it. I want to do you a favor. But he said, one, I'm, my head's not in the right place. And two, I think it's too good for my like shitty Edinburgh label. Um, and he was kind of slightly, he was just starting to release on GZ. Well, he was releasing on Subliminal at the time, Sub or Subdivision it was called, uh, which then became GZ Audio. So I just ended up sending it to George Guzzi from uh, Guzzi. Sorry, I always say Guzzi. <laughs> he, always, he always gets on me for that. Guzzi, Guzzi. <laughs> um, I ended up sending it to George, like that EP, and he loved every track. And, and that for me was like a real turning point as well, because, you know, Liam was like a friend of a friend, but like sending five tracks to, to George, who runs GZ Audio, and like this is a complete stranger who uh, like has never has nothing to do with me doesn't know doesn't he's not liking it because he likes me he's just like purely listening to music and going that's great i want to sign it that was like such a confidence booster and like it just it meant so much and and he's been so supportive of all my music i've done since and i'm now quite a big i'm not quite heavily involved in the label i do all the artwork and stuff like that for it and so i'll always be super shout out to george uh, Guzzi, because I'll I'll always be super close with him, and and I'll always be thankful for where what he did for me, basically, and you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I've I've recently touched base with those guys as well. Just like I said, I I got his name from yourself, and you know, having a chat with him about how to get the promos out now. Because yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of those labels to look out for. I think GZ, isn't it? They've got very regular releases. They've got amazing artists on there like yourself. And they're fucking nice guys as well by the by the looks of things and they're very mm. helpful to the artists so you mentioned your your relationship with them goes a little bit further than just the music now you you're a bit more heavily involved in the label altogether then tell us a bit about that yeah i mean not really i'm pretty i'm maybe overdoing it i'm not like heavily involved but i do all the artwork now yeah. so so basically yeah that's it i can i do all the artwork and and you know it's just it's more like when when i produce some music i think and i send it off to labels i'm like picky about what i say or like the kind of music i'm going to send them as well as with with george and, and gz i'm like I, I kind of i just you know i get on really well with him and he, and he respects me as an artist and i kind of feel like i could send him anything as long as it's like good enough he wouldn't be like no nah, that doesn't suit the label he'd just be like yeah let's bloody let's release it and you know and there's been a couple of tracks where i've been like because he did he he does all my mastering as well so even when i send tracks to other labels i just i get him to just give a quick master because mainly because i can't be bothered <laughs> um, so you know there's been a couple of times i've sent him a track and he's like where's that going and i'm like oh i'm planning on sending it here and he's just like please don't please please let me have it <laughs> <laughs> it sounds just like the conversation me and you have done too, <laughs> yeah. so but yeah I, obviously i met you through uh, our little music group that we've got on facebook that we chat and yeah obviously you were putting clips up there and i was fucking hell i've got to have this fucking hell i've got to have that and i, th I think we, we've ended up in the end that we've, we've got these two haven't we they're out now in dirt box but yeah we'll, we'll let the cat out of the bag there's a remix that's out coming out as well which is 
fucking phenomenal. You might have heard it in my set. There's a lot of big artists playing this remix as well. So more about that. And uh, you've done a, a release for us on our Liquid album that's coming out as well, aren't you, this year? And uh, I, th I think we had another chat about a different remix as well. So, yeah, lots coming out with that. Um, what else have you got in store this year? Um, so, yeah, apart from the stuff of yourself, like I said, I've, I've got my, yeah, I've got the program. Wow, um, amazing. Yeah, two, yeah, double, and that, that for me as well, that was a massive, massive kind of, wow, like, you know, like when I when where basically when I got the message, when I got the email back from Jim at Ram, because he's like, you know, you're emailing Ram Records, like, you know, got the email back from Jim at Ram being like, Yeah, we really like it. I was just kind of like, it was almost like, you know, oh wait, I, I am actually quite good at this kind of thing. It was like it was it was a real, you know, confirmation of my efforts and it was just it meant the world and and they're they're a label that you know, I love like I I arguably prefer a program to main label Ram now because it's just you know they have more the music same. coming out. Yeah, artists you've never heard of as well that are absolutely brilliant on there. Yeah, I'm I'm loving that label. Absolutely yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I have for like two or three years now, so it was, it was always like a milestone for me to get to that. Um, and I'm so glad I have because, and you know, it's and and they were really picky with with some of this like they loved that one track but then like they didn't like the other one and i sent them a couple of other tracks and they didn't like those and like you know they really do they have like a massively high like bar like the bar is so high for what they consider like worthy of the label so you know like i said that was that that it gives a lot of pressure but like it did make me produce an amazing track that i'm really really pleased about um and yeah so i have so i have that i have yeah i have oh i have quite a lot coming out on grand theft audio as well so i have a track Big coming up solar out. and the boys yeah 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 they're, they're they've been great as well like um again i kind of met them through through kind of like the gz gang in a way um plasma tour who's like is a really really good producer who released on gz but he's also started releasing on grand theft audio so he kind of introduced me to them and I just noticed that they were sort of like playing a lot of my stuff like in their sets before like and then i just so i just reached out to them and basically said you know i really like the label and blah blah blah, blah. and then yeah so i've got a free download coming out with them which is a two tracker like and then the week after that i've got a track on their various artists lp and then like a week after that i've got a single coming out like on on grand theft audio and um, so i'm excited for those as well um I think June, July time for me is just mental for releases. It's like I have one every week for like a good solid month and a half, two months. And then I'm kind of worried because I have nothing for the end of the year. And like, I know how long it can take to like some of labels to sometimes get music out. And I actually don't have really anything in the back catalog, in the like the back burner. And um, I've kind of had like a little bit of a I wouldn't call it a writer's block, but I've deliberate. I've just like chosen not to produce for like the last like couple of months or so. I've had quite a lot going on in my personal life, and I was just kind of like, I don't really. I I just I just my headspace wasn't there, and I didn't. I just didn't really feel like doing. It. I don't want to do it if I don't feel like doing it. But it does mean that later on this year, I might be quiet for like this later latter half of this year, early next year. I'm working on an LP that is going to be coming out on GZ Audio, um, which is basically all. I don't want to say too much about it because it's it's kind of an early works yet, but that's that'll be coming out probably late this year, early next year on GZ. Um, and yeah, apart from that, oh, actually, yeah, sorry, I just I just had a track signed with Zombie Cat's new label as well. Yeah, I was just about to mention that. I was hoping you would because that track is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. You can actually hear that on the VTO Records podcast this month as well if you mm. uh, jump over onto the SoundCloud. But how did that come around with Zombie Cats then? Because they're quite up et upper echelon neurofunk, aren't they? Yeah, totally. Again, it was just, it was literally just, I, well, do you know what, it, you know what it was? Right? I seen them post on Facebook um, saying that they were releasing a new label called Creatured and it was, and it, they were looking for artists. And I kind of thought, I'm going to send stuff to them, but. I don't quite know if I'm there yet, like kind of thing. And then I was looking at the the, the feedback from In Flight uh, and Zombie Cats like had downloaded it and said they liked the tune. So I was like, well, if they like those, they'll like this one. So I thought, bugger it, I'm just going to send them it. And yeah, they, they loved it. So yeah, yeah, they uh, they they definitely big fans of the release that you had with. I think they've actually played it, the Dirtbox release as well. So mm. just trying to locate videos. So they they do tend to just pick up. The odd track from us and stuff like that. They have played quite a few, but yeah, they're they're definitely good people to get music to. And uh, I think this new label they've got artists like T 
ti on it and things like that as well so yeah so this so it's gonna but the mad track's gonna be on a various artists it's gonna come out later this year um so i'm um, yeah i'm hoping that they've got some like massive names on it so it's like you know, i like it'll get listened to a fair bit <laughs> So, of course, this show is all about the new Dirtbox release, Mount Ericucos, and, of course, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Scream. I got that one wrong this time instead of the Mount one. But, uh, obviously, we're trying to get this out there, get some promotion going for it. Uh, what better way to sit down and let people see the face behind the music as well? So, how's it feel to have this nice Star Wars theme all around this release for you then, Ruben? Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been so good because, you know, well, from the start of this interview, we just talked about Star Wars for like 15 minutes and I can do that forever. So, and, and when I first started Best Guard, it was, I deliberately did it because I wanted to blend, you know, my love of drum and bass and my love of Star Wars together. So, and like some labels have been okay with it. Um, most labels don't even realize that like the track titles are Star Wars related, but like, you know, for, for you know, GZ, they were quite okay with me doing a little bit of Star Wars related artwork, but you know, for you guys, for like you yourself when you were like oh i really want to go all out for it and you know and have like tie fighters on the on the album art and have like you know promos with us and like helmets and stuff it's just like yeah <laughs> like right up my street <laughs> so yeah it feels it feels so good to do and then to have it released on may the 4th you know that wasn't wasn't totally intentional it just happened to be round about this time that my release was going to be coming out so we just decided to change it for like a little bit so yeah such a weird story like i knew it was a star wars release and i messaged you saying it's coming out may the 5th and then as soon as I typed that, I was like, but we should make this May the 4th, shouldn't we? <laughs> so yeah, I totally. Literally, I, I had to correct myself because all that day, in fact, all that week, I'd had the date and I set it and I'm meaning to message you. And until I actually typed it out to you and realized how stupid I sounded, typing it out, knowing that it was literally a day off to make this just perfect, to actually flow just perfect. We had to go with it, didn't we, in the end? And uh, yeah, there we go. That's what came about with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, Ruben, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on the show, mate. Um, great to put a face for myself as well, and obviously to the voice and uh, the man behind the music. Like I said, plenty of big things coming for you in the pipeline this year. To say you uh, consider it just an hobby, you know, Ram Records are taking notice. Uh, Zombie Cat signing music, obviously another LP, and like I say, some great music coming with us on Dirtbox that I can't wait for people to hear as well. It's going to be a good year, mate gonna be a good year yeah yeah you yeah, know it is it really is and um yeah it feels really nice to kind of get a bit more recognition and because like i said i've been producing you know i first opened a door in 2009 so it's like it's been a long time coming for it to be like thick and fast regular releases on labels that i'm really you know excited about so yeah I, I yeah it's been amazing and you know last year was was great for me like you know i didn't you know i was super happy with how the music went last year and this year it's only getting more and more so it's you know it, it yeah it's just as great <laughs> i'm gonna end the show with a quick star wars trivia test i'm gonna put your knowledge to the test with these questions now let's see if you can actually get any of these wrong but before we go don't forget if you go onto our social medias you can grab the new dirt box aka beska star wars merchandise We've got them all on red bubble you can order them straight away there's t-shirts cups caps everything like that so let's get into the star wars trivia then okay question one in star wars what do they call the invisible power that binds the galaxy together the force yes 
God, if you didn't get that, I would have just ended this, <laughs> pulled that release. Yeah, and yeah. Do it again. <laughs> okay, this one's a little trickier then. CP C3PO is fluent in how many languages? Oh, God. Um, I am fluent in more than six. Oh. 6,000? It's 6 Nine, million. You got 6 it. million. Ah. Oh, yeah, you were on the right. right. It's called yeah. the original number, Fred, there. But yeah, I just, like, I basically just, like, when this happens, I just have to, like, repeat the line in my head because I've seen it so many times. So, yeah, I got the first bit, 6 million. That was it. Yeah, you got the first bit. We'll give you half a point for that, even though you were <laughs> even though you were 59.7 yeah. million off. <laughs> okay. What is the name of Yoda's home? Uh, Dagobah future track release name for you there but yeah you never I, think, know. I think that's in the list <laughs> <laughs> what is the toydarian's name who owned anakin skywalker uh, what, watto watto yes excellent and what species stole the plans to the death star oh boffins yes it's boffins yes yeah, it yeah. is yeah how old is Yoda when he dies? 900. Wow, that is fantastic. Two more, two more. You're only, you've only one down, and even then you were quite close. What is the rule of two? Um, so it's basically the rule of the Sith, where there'll be no more, no less. You'll always have a master and apprentice. Fantastic. <laughs> and the last one. I'm trying to find an odd one here because there's, there's, re there's some really easy ones. Who played Han Solo? Fucking, you're not having that question. <laughs> that is not one they're having. Oh, here's a good one. Who is Luke and Leah's mother? Uh, um, Senator Amidala. Pardon me, Amidala. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> well done, Ruben. So you have passed the Star Wars test. You are worthy of using <laughs> the best scar name. Wear it with pride. But yeah, thank you for tonight, mate really appreciate your time on this and uh yeah lots of banging music to come lots of newer funk hopefully as well bit of liquid some huge releases on program maybe even ram records in the future who knows uh but yeah thanks man it's been fun no, no thank you thanks for doing it that was great excellent stuff i'll catch you soon see ya